Hello, my name is Brian Cushing. I'm the program director here at Historic Locust Grove, and I am here today to talk to you about one of my very favorite objects in our collection. This wool uniform coat is said to have belonged to George Rogers Clark Floyd and to have been with him at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Uh, that was November 1811, and at the time, George Rogers Clark Floyd held the rank of major in the 4th Regiment of United States Infantry. Now, I said that it is, it's said to have belonged to George Rogers Clark Floyd. Can I say that for sure? Can I promise? No, absolutely not. It's not signed by him on the inside or anything of that nature. And the reality is when an object is passed down through a family before it gets to a museum, there is a tendency for the story about that object to gravitate towards the most exciting people and events in that family's history. But in this case, all of the factors do match up. The style of the uniform uh, is uh, completely typical uh, for an officer of that rank. All the embellishments for that rank are correct uh, for an officer in the United States Infantry in 1811. That's before the, uh, the uniform regulations were completely overhauled in 1812. There was kind of a fashion revolution in the Army in 1812. Uh, so you see it's got um, double-breasted red lapels. Uh, they're buttoned back in this case, uh, but they, they actually do work uh, if uh, Floyd had the coat buttoned back. Uh, there are hooks and eyes that run along the inside, so it could be hooked across the chest, or he could unbutton these and button the whole coat across. And if he was to do that, you would see blue wool underneath of this red, but the metallic trim uh, is also applied to that side, and it mirrors this. So you get the same trim effect uh, no matter uh, no matter what uh, which way uh, the coat is fastened. Uh, also, another detail for George Rogers Clark Floyd uh, specifically, I said he held the rank of major, and on the shoulders on each side we have a button where an epaulette would have attached, and we have this strap that would help secure the epaulette. There's one on this side. And there's one on this side. And so majors and above at that point did wear two epaulettes. Had he been a captain or a lieutenant, uh, he would only have one uh, epaulette on his coat. So uh, later on in 1812, a single-breasted style was adopted uh, by the federal military, but actually some of the states in 1812, including Kentucky, still specified uh, that their officers should wear double-breasted coats like this, even though the federal trend was going towards a single-breasted. And then they changed the regulations again in 1813, and all the red went away. Uh, a lot of the trim went away, too. And so you had a very sleek, uh, very just kind of elegantly plain blue coat uh, in 18, by 1813, and that was kind of seen as more appropriate for a young republic that had twice thrown off the yoke of, of monarchy for this kind of sleek plain uniform without all of the embellishments. Uh, another object in our collection, uh, the portrait of Lieutenant Colonel George Cron that's in our downstairs parlor. If you come, you see that he's wearing a coat of those regulations, and he thought it looked so good that when he went back in the military in the 1820s and things had changed, he thought they should go back to the, the 1813 model. Uh, so, a uh, little moment in time here. Uh, it's a really neat object. Ordinarily, this is stored in our collection storage, flat in an archival box, uh, but once in a while, uh, we get to get it back out and put it on a mannequin so that our guests can see it. You might notice it's hanging kind of strangely. The shoulders on this coat are so narrow uh, that we don't have a male mannequin to fit it, so we actually have to use a, a female mannequin to display George Rogers Clark Floyd's coat. Uh, so this is one of many objects uh, that you'll see when you come through Locust Grove, and at this point we have had several generations of very dedicated, passionate, knowledgeable people curating uh, what gets held here in our collections, what gets displayed here for the public to show you a little bit of what life was like over 200 years ago. So next time you're with us and you look around these rooms, remember that every single object was, uh, was chosen, was considered uh, by people who were dedicated to making this place the best it can be, and it's an ongoing process. We continue to learn and we continue to change as new information comes to light. And tomorrow is Give for Good Louisville on Thursday, September the 17th, so I hope that you'll find it in your heart to give us, uh, give us a little donation, help us 
keep on going to bring all of this uh, to people who pass through both from Louisville and who are just uh, you know passing through from out of state and want to get a taste for uh, what the history of this place uh, was like. We're making it through these tough times. We're going to make it through, but we could really use your help. So thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope we see you again for another installment of Ask a Curator.